The first reading is from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. The days are surely coming, says God, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their spouse, says God. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says God. I will put my law among them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they need to teach one another or say to each other, No God, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says God. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Second reading is from the book of Romans, uh, chapter 3, verses 19 through 28. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in God's sight by deeds prescribed by the law, but through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been and continues to be disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by Christ's blood, effective through faith. God did this to show God's righteousness because in the divine forbearance, God has passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that God's self is righteous and that God justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No. But by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. Our third reading tonight comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had started to believe in him, If you remain in my word, you are my true disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham, and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, you will become free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son remains there forever. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. dedication tonight is an insert in your bulletin. It, of course, it's a very, very long well hymn. We would ask you to stand as you are able and help us sing, uh, Mighty Fortress is Our God.
The title for this sermon came from the president of my seminary, Martin Copenhaver. Uh, I did go back to him afterwards and ask him if he would give me the rest of the sermon. Uh, unfortunately for you, he declined. <clears throat> In our text, Jesus declares that everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. This is more active than the accidental sins that we often commit. But the sin Jesus is talking about is not just an action. This sin represents an underlying condition. I suspect that's why the Gospel writer chose the word that I translated here as practices. And what is our underlying condition? We reject the truth about ourselves. As we heard earlier, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. All too often we try to convince ourselves that there is nothing really wrong with us. Just give me some good advice or self-help book and things will be fine. We pig-headedly insist that we are basically in control. Surely our going to church and our charitable giving and just our basic holiness is sufficient. Now, I do apologize for the use of the word son in the translation and what I'm about to say, but in the culture of the times, not all children had the same rights and privileges. The verse 36 shoots us down. If the son sets you free, this is not something we can do ourselves. As a matter of fact, it's not something we have control over. Did I see a flinch? In our wonderful hymn, Mighty Fortress, we find these words. If we in our own strength confide, our striving turns to losing. But there is one who takes our side, the one of God's own choosing. When Jesus talks about the truth, he's not just talking about facts and knowledge. What Jesus is talking about is what God reveals to us in the Word and in the life death, and resurrection of Christ. You might call this divine truth. Now I could do a whole sermon on truth, and actually have twice, <clears throat> but I will not inflict that on you tonight, uh, because we don't have all night. The word used here is free, can also mean to exempt from. And most commentators explain this verse as meaning the Christ disciples, if they remain or abide in his word, will be exempt from the alleged burdens of the law. But here I call upon Paul to explain this further as the law of sin and death. Paul reminds us that the law's purpose is to expose sin. Luther sometimes calls the law the hammer of God. Elsewhere, Paul says that the wages are end result of sins is death. Now Paul is probably meaning the 613 mitzvot, or commandments that are found in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the First Testament. We could not possibly follow all of them. Shoot, I can't even remember all of them. So we cannot become righteous by trying to follow them. So Paul can easily declare, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, I'm not sure if Paul means here the glory in the ancient sense as the part of God that accompanied the Jews out of Egypt and lived in the temple, or does he mean Jesus personally? Actually, I don't think it really matters here, because either way, we come up short. But I do think Paul's use of the, of the word righteous here is intended to hearken back to Abraham, who trusted in God's promise and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Uh, here's your homework. Since I have to do homework, you have to do homework. You can read more about this in Paul's short letter to the Galatians, which I do recommend. Then Paul mentions the law of faith. This law is not one of those 613 mitzvot, so what does he mean? Enter Jeremiah with an explanation. In the New Covenant, God puts the laws in our midst and writes the laws on our hearts. The heart was seen as the dwelling place of the Spirit, which Paul says we live by. So this law of faith is inside of us. Thus the law has been reformed 
to better help us in our daily lives in a changing world. But we can't be free of that law. That would contradict Jesus' intent. So how are we free? I don't think Jesus was looking forward to the land of the free and the home of the brave. This is not the kind of freedom we are to have, and he already have. That mistake is what the Jews that Jesus was talking to have made. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus asks if God could possibly take the curse of an agonizing and humiliating death on the cross from him. And Jesus ends with what I call the Gethsemane Confession. I'm sure there's some other fancy term for this, but I haven't had that course yet. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. When I was wrestling with going to seminary, and I now understand this to be a very common situation, I finally had to appropriate this confession for myself. I had long before accepted this faith intellectually, but finally came to the point where I could accept it in my heart. With that surrender, the wrestling ended and peace came over me. I was free. How strange it is that freedom comes from giving up one's own will and following the will of another. We could say that we've been freed of the trouble of making a decision, but this is more than that. Last week I participated in an interfaith conference in California. The schedule was hectic, including a 22-hour Thursday and only two hours of sleep. And I arrived home at midnight on Sunday after having done almost no homework during those four days, and Tuesday was lost due to a mandatory community day at school, which included a wonderful afternoon of raking leaves. <clears throat> so that left squeezing the whole week's homework, including a significant paper, into three days. By Thursday afternoon, I was getting very, very frustrated and getting very angry about my life not being in my control. As I sat down to get my hair washed, my hairdresser said something about praying. I suddenly realized that I needed to talk to the only one who really is in control. The anger and frustration went away quickly as I realized that my control of my life is just an illusion. It's in. <clears throat> Martin Luther argues in his wonderful piece, The Bondage of the Will, that our sinful nature makes us struggle against good and towards evil. He further points out that the Jews pursued righteousness for all their powers and failed. Yet it was the Gentiles, us, who pursued ungodliness and that unexpectedly attained righteousness through grace. As Paul says, that grace comes as a gift. A gift given to our two parties, the giver and the recipient. Now the giver may extend their hand with the gift in it, but the recipient must do their part as well. If the recipient does not accept the gift, has it been given? I'll leave that answer to the philosophers. This is the lesson that I learned and continue to learn and would like to pass on. Only when we give up the illusion of having our own will and control of our lives do we actually get it. And isn't that what Jesus said? Those who lose their life for my sake will find it. What a strange idea for freedom. By giving up what we feel is freedom, we get the real freedom in serving others. When we surrender our will to God, we are set free. Maybe that's part of why they call it the scandal of the gospel. And maybe that's why some of us flinch when Jesus says free.